Hello, and welcome to Cynthia Mazzaferro's wonderful show on miracle messages and creating the life that you want to live. I have a really special guest today, um, Mary Stirk, and she is an expert on many things, but it comes down to money, which we all need to know about. So let me tell you a little bit more about Mary's um, specific bio, and then we'll get to meet Mary and talk more candidly. Mary Stirk is a CFP, is the owner of Stirk Financial Services in Dakota Dunes, South Dakota. Mary's inspirational story of fighting her way back from welfare to wealth management has motivated many, many people to believe that anything is possible. She built a better future despite a teenage pregnancy, living in low-income housing, and raising two small children without child support while subsisting on food stamps. So that's quite a uh, resume, if you will. <laughs> Her quote, if I can achieve this, anyone can, has inspired women throughout the country to strive for their own bright future. Mary has been in the investment and insurance industry since 1994 and earned her certi certified financial planning degree through the American College in Pennsylvania. Mary has authored two books, Ready to Pull the Retirement Trigger, which we're going to be focusing on, and Buy It, the Practical Guide to Buying a Financial Service Book of Business. Both are available on Amazon, and I encourage you to further explore those after this interview. Her radio show podcast, Money Guide with Mary Stirk, educates and inspires listeners to create their best financial future. Mary also has an artistic side and has created uplifting messages of hope through her art via Just Mary Designs. In her downtime, Mary enjoys spending time with her three children and one grandson and flying her Piper Cherokee. Wow, you have a lot of different talents, Mary. <laughs> uh, and you can uh, connect with Mary, contact her through her website, which is Mary Stirk at Stirk financialservices.com. So welcome, Mary. How are you? Thank you. I'm wonderful. And thank you so much for having me as a guest on your show. My pleasure, because you know, finances is usually at the root of many people's stress in their life. And of course, that can cause unhappiness. So um, unfortunately, we can't just go run into the Amazon and never need money again in our life. We need money. So coming up with budgets and looking for our future, planning for retirement is so integral in creating that happiness we want, especially in our later part of our years. So can I first ask you, I know you already wrote one book, what caused you to want to write a second book? Well, I get a lot of questions from people about how to know whether or not you're ready to actually retire. And it's such a common issue and such a common theme for so many people. So um, after having that conversation dozens, maybe hundreds of times, I decided I would take kind of the accumulated knowledge I have had from working with people and their retirement plans over 25 years and put it into a book that is relatable and something that people can use as a strategic guide so they can know if they are actually ready to pull that retirement trigger. Great. And one of the things I like about it, it's so easy to read. It's user friendly. You don't have to have a Thank financial you. degree. To understand <laughs> it. So that's really important. Um, so t tell me, what are the main issues that people, people are facing as they actually do contemplate retirement? Well, I think that the main issues people face in retirement really come down to three things. The first one is emotional readiness. The mm. second one is health-related factors. And the third one is the financial side of it. And addressing one without paying attention to all three doesn't really leave you in a position where your ducks are in a row. So a good retirement plan is going to encompass strategies in all three of those areas. And that's what leads you down a solid path towards retirement. Interesting. I've never heard anyone as a financial planner. My husband's an accountant or a financial person by trade. He's retired. We both are. But um, I've never heard him or anyone else ever speak about the emotional and health components as being two pillars as to whether or not you're ready to retire. Okay, so can you go into those a little bit more? 
Absolutely, because I really do think it's like a three-legged stool. <laughs> so the, um, let's talk about the emotional readiness part of it. So when somebody is contemplating actually retiring, then um, there's a lot of different thoughts that are going through their head. But for many people, their identity has been wound up in their career. So as they transition from having that identity to something completely different and often unknown, it can be very um, upsetting to their their uh, brain, upsetting to their personality. And, and a lot of times people just don't really know what they're going to do with their time. <laughs> right. And, and um, what you're saying, they really, it, their whole schedule and also where we tend to place our value system on ourselves has been yes. totally disrupted if we leave that system. Very much so. And it also can disrupt relationships. So from a standpoint of someone being married, you mentioned your husband was an accountant. If one of you retires and the other one doesn't at the same time, that can sometimes cause friction points within the marriage. Um, and then also if someone has been retired for a while and the other one now retires, that also can cause friction points because people are used to doing their own thing and they have their own routine. And they don't really want someone to come in and upset their apple cart. <laughs> it actually happened for me, too. We were the empty nesters. Our children were now past college. And okay. On their own. And I was at home pretty much doing my own private business, but pretty much not working nine to five type job. And he comes home and it was like, so I'm asking him, what's he doing? What are you in my business for? And, you know, so the dynamics of a yep. relationship changes. Um, so I think that's very, I'm happy to hear that that's in your book because I think it's a very integral part into creating a healthier relationship with your family members. So it doesn't have to be just your spouse or significant others, but um, even dynamics with your parents and your sibling, your children even, can really be a muck, <laughs> really be impacted. Definitely. My, um, <clears throat> I, I used to be married. I'm divorced now, but my ex mother-in-law had said when her husband retired, I've been retired for several years now. And just because you retire, don't expect me to make your lunch every day. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he was a little taken aback, but she was like, listen, this is my time. I'm used to my own groove. And, and so that can cause a friction point. So from an emotional readiness standpoint, the, the things that you want to pay attention to when it comes to retirement planning really are, how do you think you're going to want to spend your time? And then how is it going to impact relationships, you know, within your life? Um, and the part about how you want to spend your time really does come down to and connect with something that I call your money philosophy. And so a money philosophy is all about how you use the money that you have to align it with the things that matter in your life. So when you look at your retirement, you do want to spend some concrete time thinking about what do you want retirement to look like? And then a strong retirement plan is going to actually align the money you have with that life that you want to live. Very important. And I, I think that, Another component that goes into that is because depending when you retire and your health, which we're going to get into, we don't know how long we're going to live. So no. I think there's also an aspect, um, there are some people that save, they don't want to use their resources because like we don't know how many years later, it could be 30 years or more, that we need to then be able to rely on our savings that we've put away, hopefully. Um, that has that nest egg. So, or then you have the ones that, hey, I want to spend it. I'm not going to take it to the grave and I'm going to use it. And then you don't have it when you're at, when you need it at the end either. So it is a very challenging point of time in one's life because everything changes. Really. Right. It is a massive transition. There's another big paradigm shift that happens too when somebody retires that people don't often talk about. And that's that most people have spent their entire lives setting aside money mm. for retirement, that rainy day money, that money that they know they're not supposed to touch. And they may have been doing this for 30 or 40 years. Right. And now the time has come for them to touch that and to spend that. And for a lot of people, shifting into doing that feels like they're doing something wrong. <laughs> yeah. It feels like they're making a mistake or doing something naughty because for all those years, they know they weren't supposed to touch it and now they are. 
So that's a big paradigm shift too, is, is moving into the mindset that it's okay to spend the money that you've saved for retirement. That's what it's there for. It's but almost to do being, so mindfully. Yeah, excuse me. It's almost as if you need permission to now use your nest, the little egg you yes. You'd be surprised how many people actually do need someone to say that it's okay to do that. <laughs> well, even I know even myself personally, you know, we have our savings that we have and we're in a good place. And I've said to my husband, you know, our children are very, um, in careers that are going to be very supportive of theirs and they don't need necessarily our inheritance. Um, and it's like, how much do we need to give them? We should be also enjoying our money as well. You, we've worked hard. We've saved hard and long. So I, I think what you're bringing up is a really good point. Well, um, and that's a tricky thing, too, about planning that I'll touch on for just a minute since you brought it up, because everybody's plan is always unique. There's no one-size-fits-all retirement plan. Mm -hmm. Some people want to leave a specific financial legacy for children. And for some people, that's a dollar amount. For some people, that maybe is a piece of property that has a particular emotional connotation, like a lake house where there's been years and years of wonderful family vacations. And some people just want to spend their last dollar the day they die. <laughs> they don't have any legacy goals. And each of those ideas is fine. It just depends on what your own unique situation is. And that's why planning is so personal, because it really does need to be designed for your life. And then if there's a lot of what ifs in your life, like you said, how long will you live? How much money will you spend? What do you want to spend your time doing? Things like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So let's go into the second prong that you brought up of the <clears throat> three-legged uh, stool, and that is about health-related issues. How does that relate to our retirement? All right, so the two primary things with the health-related issues are figuring out what to do with health insurance during retirement, and the second piece of it is what to do to prepare for or prevent against financial ruin if you have some type of nursing home or long-term chronic care situation. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the health insurance side of it first. If you retire early, you'll need to have some type of gap measure where you have health insurance that will take care of you from the time you retire until you're 65 and Medicare can start. Mm -hmm. But once you're 65, you can go into the Medicare system. It would be really nice if the Medicare system was simple and easy to understand. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> and hopefully it will still be there when we're there, too. <laughs> That's true. We don't really know what's going to happen. We don't even know what's going to happen with private health insurance at the end of this year. You exactly. Know? So there's a lot of um, mystery surrounding that. But from a Medicare standpoint, there is several components that people have to get in line. They have to have the Medicare pieces, and then they have to have the supplement pieces. There's a lot of complexity to that, and that's why it's definitely part of the retirement plan. The second piece of that is um, really addressing people's biggest fear of, well, what happens to my retirement if something you know, unexpected or bad happens with my health or even the health of their spouse? And for some people, retirement can be completely blown up if they have to all of a sudden pull 40 or 50 or $60,000 a year out of their budget in order to take care of someone who is in a nursing home type of situation. And that's a good point. And just to let you know, the standard for nursing home care is 100000 a year. So, you know, if you're having to pay for that yourself because your insurance doesn't cover that. So it's, it's yeah. very high. And I think it depends on what area of the country you're in and how much care that you need. But we do see it anywhere from, you know, maybe $60,000 a year on the low end up to that $100,000, $120,000 a year range. And so it is something that is very damaging to a retirement budget. Think about it. If your entire retirement budget is $80,000 a year and now you have to spend that on a nursing home, there's nothing left for your spouse <laughs> to live on. It, it's so. very complicated because if mm -hmm. you don't have a substantial worth and whatever that number is, and um, you think you'll eventually fall into the Medicaid system, which is a um, supportive, federal supported system, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I believe it's seven years you have to go out to have not enough resources, financial wealth of yourself, to, to prove to Medicaid that you don't have that net worth. And so even that part of uh, financial planning becomes very integral 
in setting yourself up correctly to mm-hmm. qualify for Medicaid, correct? Yeah, it does. And, and Medicaid is now becoming a state-run program, so each oh. state has some different rules for it. But they are, what you're talking about is called a look-back period, where if you've given away anything in that look-back period, mm-hmm. then Medicaid will claw it back. What a wonderful term, right? They'll claw <laughs> it back. But um, the, the, here, here's the thing, I guess, for listeners to kind of key into as a good rule of thumb. If you have $300,000 of retirement savings or less to last you your entire retirement, you may not need to look at paying for some type of long-term care insurance, okay? Because the truth of it is, you probably are likely to spend down most of your retirement savings during your lifetime and be eligible for Medicaid. Conversely, if you have $3 million or more, you also may not need that coverage because you probably have enough money and income from that retirement savings to pay for your own care. But it's the people that are in that middle ground between $300,000 and $3 million of retirement savings, especially if you're married, that really need to look at whether or not this is a gap they want to fill in their retirement planning. Oh, I love that. I love that you really gave some benchmarks to help people realize where am I falling in this picture and where do I maybe need guidance, financial mm-hmm. guidance and a retirement planning. So that's, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing such clear, objective um, benchmarks, if you will. You're welcome. Um, so how do you make sure your money and your investments are positioned properly? And I know part of that, I suspect you're going to talk about how you may change your investment products as you continue to age. Mm-hmm. And is that where you're going to be going on with this? Um, to some degree, yes. But really, that is part of the third leg of our three-legged stool, right? It's all thing that financial matters. Right. And so when it comes to the financial piece in retirement, you really want to be focusing on how do you turn what you've saved into income and how do you know if your investments are positioned properly so that you can feel very confident that it's time to pull that retirement trigger. So um, to know if your investments are positioned properly really comes down to kind of a handful of different things. You want to make sure that what you have has the right level of risk in it. And that's something that's very personal, right? Your risk level might even be different than your husband's risk level. (laughs) So understanding how you feel about risk and working either yourself through kind of some quizzes that are out there or working with an advisor to um, figure out how much risk you're willing to take inside of your retirement accounts is a really, really important part of the planning. And um, that might be the easiest step of it all, is to figure out what we call your risk tolerance level, okay? So before you go any further, because there's some people that are listening might not understand what risk level means. So can you just back down, kind of dumb it down a little bit more for us, because not everyone understands that. Um, So if you could define that better, I'd appreciate it. That's a really good point. And that's probably something that a lot of financial people do all of the time is speak in acronyms or speak in jargon that's difficult for everybody to understand. So I'm really glad that you asked that question. So a risk level really just means how much you're comfortable with your money going up and down. (laughs) <laughs> That's the and bottom for line. How long are you willing to have that risk level? Yes, exactly. So the longer that your time horizon is, the longer amount of time you're willing to leave money invested, for most people, they feel a little bit more comfortable taking risk because if they don't need the money till out here, then it going up and down along the way isn't quite as uncomfortable. But right. when you need the money right here, then you don't have as much time in your plan and the sooner that you need the money the less risk you're probably willing to take because you don't want to have it go down right before you need it (laughs) and a good example of this is like um let's say your grandparents leave your children ten thousand dollars each and they're two and seven and ten years old well you wouldn't want to really necessarily put ten thousand dollars in a savings account that gets 0.25 percent 
because your children are so young that they have a very long lifespan okay. and you have a greater opportunity to have higher risk like you were saying that the stock market will go up and down but if you draw a line in between the middle of it you know that you're going to have a much better interest yield than keeping it in a very stable concise um, constant interest rate which is so minimal yes so, in the opposite spectrum, this is like for when you have children very young, as you grow older, and you correct me because I am not a financial expert, but I've heard a lot from my husband, um, and I'm a lay person, I'm not a financial person, so I try to be able to express it for lay people listening to this, and then you can change it, correct me, whatever I need to be done here. But as you get into that 40, 50 years old, you're still not really retiring, you may have different types of investment products that have a, a significant amount of risk still. But as you get farther closer to retirement or into retirement, maybe you could talk about how, let's say you have five investment products. Um, you may choose to pick two or three that still stay on a higher risk, and then two you may go at a more constant or stable risk um, or lesser risk. Is that true? That's true for many investors. It kind of depends on who you are. Again, planning is very personal, but there's a lot of weight to the theory that the investments that you're going to be using sooner rather than later should have a much more stable focus to them. And the ones that still have a longer time until you're going to utilize them, you still have time to have risk in there. Now, the degrees of risk are going to vary by person. But if you do it like that, if you have stability in the assets that you're going to use sooner and you have risk, more risk in the assets you're going to use later, you avoid something that's called the sequence of returns risk. And in a nutshell, this is a risk that people don't really know is out there or that matters. But if you have negative years where you've lost money in your investments in the first two or three years of your retirement, it has an impact that's hard to recover from for the rest of your retirement. So those assets that you're going to utilize at the beginning of retirement, if you can eliminate some of the risk in them or at least drastically reduce it, then the impact of having negative returns at the beginning of the sequence of your retirement years is definitely minimized. Great. Well, see, even these type of things, you really need an expert, uh, someone to help guide you and to, um, give you some suggestions as to, you know, solidifying your portfolio into, you know, two or three items instead of being all over the board. Lots of things to cover. And it really depends on your net worth, really where that scope is and, and your objectives. You know, what do you really want? What's your objectives for that money with respect to yourself, your legacy, and, you know, your own health issues and things like that. So Right. You're, you're totally right about it with what you're saying. And a couple of things that I would add to that is you can kind of think about it in terms of buckets, right? Mm -hmm. So you can kind of think about it and there might be a bucket of now money, meaning that you know you're going to need it in the next year. And you probably don't want any risk in that, right? Then you have student money, which might be the money that you're likely to spend within the next 10 years. And then you'd have later money, which is the money that you're probably not likely to spend for 10 years or more. And there is a method to the madness of what kind of money belongs in these different buckets mm -hmm. and how much should belong in them in order to minimize the risk. And the whole idea with minimizing the risk is just to make sure that you don't run out of money, <laughs> right. right? That's the goal is to not run out of money before we run out of life. <laughs> I love that. That's great. That's really wonderful. And, and, and it does seem complicated. And, um, you know, this is actually a good situation to be in, um, having to figure out how to mm -hmm. manage your retirement funds. Yes. And so I would love for you just to quickly comment for those who are much younger that are listening on this call, the importance of putting away money now when you're young, 18, 20, five years old, you know, starting to build this retirement, you can never start young enough. And can you just explain that from your financial? You know that there's an old saying that time is money. Right. And, and most people think about that in terms of how they're spending their time. Mm -hmm. But I want you to think about it in terms of 
time invested is money. <laughs> the longer that you leave money invested, the more it has the opportunity to grow and compound and grow and compound. And so the younger you can start, the better. Um, we have a podcast that um, you talked about called Money Guide with Mary Stirk, and we just released an episode that is talking about um, money tips for college grads. You know, as you're coming out of that, you know, time, you're going through yet another financial transition, right? Graduating from college and entering life is a financial transition, much like retirement is a financial transition but later often, in life. But often with a lot of debt, you know, a yes. lot of people coming out of college with huge debt. Absolutely. And so um, in our podcast, we gave a lot of tips about what college grads can think about to do with their money, but how to set themselves up so that they're making smart money moves now instead of waiting to five years or 10 years from their retirement. Right. With, by the time someone comes to me to do retirement planning, they usually have money spread out in a whole bunch of places. They have accounts here and accounts there and old retirement plans through old jobs and their brother-in-law used to be an advisor and they have an account here and their neighbor used to do something and they have an account here. They have things spread out all over the place. Mm -hmm. That's the normal state of somebody's finances. And anywhere from, you know, five to 10 years before retirement is the ideal time to go talk to an advisor and to start bringing all of those things together and look at it from a universal picture. Right. What, what you've done with those accounts might make sense in the account, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that makes sense from an overall viewpoint and how it's going to correlate into you having a successful retirement. And optimizing is really what you say. And then, of course, capitalizing on your IRAs, you know, all the different types of non-taxable income, yep. really benefiting from that. And also making sure if your employer is, um, provides a program that they will match what you um, contribute into your 401k, for example, you want to be maxed out on that. And you want to really take, that's free money waiting for you to claim it. So there's lots of advice here. Um, that's just, I know it's in your book. I encourage you to go out and check. Do you have a book, a copy of it? You can I do. It's right here. It's called Ready to Pull the Retirement Trigger. And it's your strategic guide to retiring with confidence. This book is actually a fairly quick read and it has a lot of stories in it. So I wrote it that way on purpose because I really wanted people to um, recognize themselves in some of the stories and understand how to get from point A to point B. Um, and the book is available on Amazon. It's available through Barnes and Noble. It will be in bookstores across America on June 20th. <laughs> so I'm very excited about that. Yes, thank you. But um, the, the whole idea with being ready to pull the retirement trigger is if you can get your emotional readiness in line with your health issues, in line with your money, and those three things kind of come together, you can get to a point where work is optional. It's so dynamic. And there's even more things. Do we live in the same house? Do we want to go into a state that has um, better... Um, it's tax rule. <laughs> yeah. um, do we, you know, are we able to manage this house as we get older, the lawn and the, the outside maintenance? I mean, there's so many things and all that's emotional. Do we leave the house? There's so much ties here. It's very complicated. And I know even for myself, you know, we have a lot of family nearby an hour away. We really would like to go to a different state that's more beneficial than Connecticut. Connecticut's very highly taxed. It does not do well for a state planning. Um, but this is why I live in South Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> There's no state income tax in South Dakota. Yeah. I'm not a financial planner for nothing. <laughs> exactly. so there is a lot, even more than that three prong stool that really, I mean, those are the basics. And yes, you can say these fall under emotional aspects, if you will. But you know, um, you know, if you have a good enough health, do you want to be down by the shore? Do you want to play golf? Do you want to play tennis? whatever you want to go sail around the world you know for a whole year there's so many things and it's very hard i know working with clients on just what do you want out of life you know, nothing to do with mm -hmm. money at all what is it that make you happy do you know that most people will sit there for five minutes and not be able to articulate what they want in their life i can and definitely so believe that it's very hard to think um you know when do i want to retire um 
And so many times, I'm sure that you probably are starting to see a shift in the type of clients you see where um, companies are downsizing. They're giving you the golden umbrella where they're getting rid of the upper management that's been with them for 30 years because they're paying you a lot of money. We can pay some people out of college half your salary, you know, and get the new technology, the new brilliance. So these are employees, employees, you know, yourself that could be found out of a job, what you thought you were going to be working there for another five years, and all of a sudden, things totally shift. So here's the interesting thing about what you're saying is that sometimes retirement might come at a time where you weren't necessarily expecting it. And and figuring out whether or not you can be retired is all going to come down to that nasty word that nobody likes to say, the budget, <laughs> right? And so the, first of all, I guess I just want to say there are two main ways that people can figure out how much they need to spend in retirement, right? One of them is to do an estimate and to say, here's what I'm making now. And here's what I'm not going to be spending in retirement. Because when you're in retirement, you don't have to pay FICA taxes, which is 7.5% of your income. You don't have to pay Medicare taxes anymore, which is 3 plus percent of your income. And you don't have to save for retirement anymore, which is oftentimes... You don't have to pay the gas or the transportation if you're taking a train to work. So all of there's a lot of costs. You don't have to eat lunches out. You know, I mean, lots yep. of things. Yep. That's huge. So for a lot of people, you know, you can end up spending maybe 15 to 25% less once you're in retirement than what you had been spending when you were employed, okay? And so figuring out what you're no longer going to be spending is kind of a quick and easy way to do estimates for, for needs. The other way to do it is to do it with an actual budget. Mm -hmm. And um, most people don't know how to do a budget, and it's hard to even think about all of the things that go into a budget. So we actually built a great budget tool for people that want to take the time to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and it has all the categories in it that over the years we've seen people actually have in their budget. And then we put it into a format where it's really easy to see money in and money out and whether or not there's a gap. And people can come out to our website at sterkfinancialservices.com and click on the learn button. And the first thing underneath that is about our strategic retirement toolkit. And inside that kit is this budget tool. It will really shed some light on how much money you are likely to need every year during retirement. And then we go to the next level with it. So Cynthia, you know how some of the bills that you pay every month, you pay every month, right? right. <laughs> and some of the things that you do, like you mentioned, a trip around the world or traveling or things like that, that might be something you do once in a while, but it's not necessarily a monthly expense, right? So there's a big difference between fixed expenses, which are something that you spend month in and month out, and variable expenses, which can vary from month to month. Mm -hmm. Right. And so this budget tool that we created is color coded so people can easily see what are their fixed expenses and what are their variable expenses. And if there's nothing else that someone takes away from this today, let me give you um, a great strategy that you can try to set up for yourself. And that's called the fixed with fixed strategy. What's it called again? One more time. The fixed with fixed strategy. Interesting. Okay. okay. And if you can take your fixed incomes, which are incomes that come in every month, and if they can get to equal at least what your fixed expenses are, those bills that go out every month, that is a very beautiful marriage <laughs> in retirement planning. <laughs> so fixed incomes are things like a social security check or a pension check or an annuity check or CD interest or something like that, but something that gets paid to you every month. If you can get those to align with what those outgoing expenses are, then that means you have got your day-to-day -day basic expenses taken care of, okay? And that's a really good way to set yourself up to never outlive your money, to never run out of money. It also means that all the rest of your money is for the fun, for the variable stuff, for the stuff that you get to kind of play with. And that's a great way to think about it. And on our budget tool, 
we've set up, here's what the fixed color, you know, the fixed income and the fixed expenses are one color. So you can see if there's a gap with that and the variable expenses and the variable income are another color. So you can, you know, some people are visual and some people are numbers. <laughs> and so this is a great way for people to kind of visually see where their gaps are or where their strengths are in their planning. Great. There's some really practical advice. And, and to be honest, I think everyone should have, and again, I, we have people, I have people on my Facebook page and following me that are in their 20s. Uh -huh. And, um, and I, although most are from 40 to 65-ish or 70. Um, but if you're a 20-year-old, you should have a budget. You know, how much can I afford for my Friday, Saturday night plans? You know, what's the discretionary income? How much am I putting away saving? Um, mm -hmm. Do I have enough in case the car needs new tires? Or, you know, you really need to plan because being informed and um, allows you the capability to grow and not have to be bankrupt or to have your credit cards maxed out where you're paying just portions of the principal and you're paying more in principal. Uh, more Absolutely. In the yep. So it's, it's so important um, in that you really, if you don't have enough financial resources or expertise, um, it's encouraging to get someone to go and ask for someone that can help get you on the right road to set up the right plan to start with. You, you know, you don't have to be married to them forever if you can't afford that, but um, having that great um, catalyst to start with is really important. I wanna bring up another thing, because I know um, some people on my Facebook page as well will say, oh, I wish I could afford even your book, I'm on dis disability. And, you know, I'm thinking my book's only $13. You know, our Kindle, it's, it was 99 cents at one point. So what can people who are at very low ends of the income or they're on disability, which is a very fixed um, income level, what do, you, what do you recommend for them? So for people who are on a very fixed income level, you, it all comes down to making sure that you're managing your expenses in the best way possible. Um, if you're, the, the, the good news for people that are in that situation is that many of their medical expenses are covered. Um, by their disability coverage or by being on Medicare disability or things like that. So there's some, some breaks that they oftentimes can get if that's the situation. But it does all come down to sustainable cash flow. And so budgeting is a very important part of that. Um, you touched on something, though, that I want to mention that kind of crosses the, um, I guess, the arena of uh, being able to save and, and being able to set yourself up for the best thing in the future. And that is, even if it's just a little bit, it's good to start whenever you can. Um, even if it's $5 a paycheck, it's good to get that into your retirement plan for later. Even if it's just $10 a paycheck, it's good to start building up that emergency fund so that something that does happen unexpected in your life doesn't wipe you out financially or drive you to max out credit cards and create a credit problem for yourself. So little bits matter and little bits consistently are what get a lot of people to where they want to be. Exactly. You know, when I raised my children and we would give them some money or allowances or they were given, given money for their birthdays or special events, graduation, we just always taught them that, you know, whatever you're given for money, you know, you take 25% of it and it would go into your savings account and they would go in. Back then it was a little blue books, you know, saving book. <laughs> um, yep. We didn't have ATMs. Um, it was 30 years ago. Um, but the point is, it is teaching them and my children are great savers now. I was teaching them uh, financially being um, prudent and responsible and realizing that just because I was given whatever, $10, mm -hmm. $5, $20, $100, um, that a certain percent should go towards um, your long-term savings. Um, I have a, I have a um, rule that I came up with that I call the rule of thirds. And I like to apply it to what we call windfall money or surprise money or unexpected money, money that isn't necessarily part of your normal paycheck, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you have money enter your life like that, which many of us do on a frequent basis, maybe even it's your tax return, the rule of thirds is take one third of it and pay down debt, 
take one third of it and save it for your long-term retirement savings and take one third of it and enjoy it now, have some fun with it. Because I do great. think that we need to balance living today and enjoying the fruits of our labor and our money today with the long-term because that just helps us be more balanced when it comes to our entire outlook and money philosophy. Um, but so not having it be skewed all one way or all the other way is generally where I find the best balance for people. I love that. And we, I would also like to encourage people to remember to tithe, whether it's a special cancer foundation, if it's your religion, um, a 501c3 that you, which is also a tax benefit to mm -hmm. donate to that. Um, so to also be philanthropic because the more we give, the universe will also return and it's what we should do. Um, Absolutely. So that's another aspect. Another thing I'd like to bring up, and I don't know if you include this in your book, is about the importance of a will. Uh, yes, I do. In fact, we have a chapter in the book that is about estate planning and what are the things that you want to make sure you're including in a good estate plan. So there's, there's what we call a three pack of documents that everybody should have. Okay. The first one is a will. And that is simply a document that says, here's, gonna, here's who is going to get your stuff. Now, a lot of people think, well, I don't really have much stuff, so maybe I don't need one. But the truth is, if you don't decide, then the state that you live in will decide for you. Right. It's, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure I don't want South Dakota deciding anything for me. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, think of it just even simple things. Maybe you have a four-year-old car. Well, a four-year-old car to a niece that's going to college is a wonderful thing, maybe. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, so... We sh and again, that's because sometimes we don't really appreciate or see the value in things that we have that, um, you know, it could just be something sentimental. It could be a beautiful ring that someone left from three generations. Who do you want to have that ring? So these are all important questions, not just the money, who gets the money or the property. There's right. a lot of other things that are in your home. The second document that everyone should have is called a financial power of attorney. And a financial power of attorney is a document, it's called a standby document, meaning it doesn't take effect until you no longer can take care of your own affairs. But a financial power of attorney is designed to say, if I can't mentally take care of my own self anymore, then here's who I want to be in charge of my finances. Okay. Now, is that and different than just a standard power of attorney when you say financial power of attorney? So sometimes they're called a general power of attorney and sometimes they're called a financial power of attorney. Okay. Okay. And then the last one is called a healthcare power of attorney. Mm -hmm. That is different than a general power of attorney. It's specifically for healthcare. It's broader than the living will. Um, but the healthcare power of attorney says, if you can no longer decide how you want your medical care to be taken care of, you're designating someone to make those decisions for you. And so it's bigger than just the whole pull the plug, don't pull the plug question. It really is about standard of care and what you want to have happen and when. And so if you have those three documents, the will, the financial power of attorney, and the healthcare power of attorney, if you have those three documents on file, that is a great basis for a sound estate plan. Right, exactly. I so encourage everyone to do what you're saying, Mary. It's so important. And I will say that you tell me what the time frame is because I believe, because we were just at this process, we're redoing our will. And what happens is, you know, you kind of create this will at some point when you have children, especially because what happens if you or your husband, for some reason, something happens, your children are left parentless, who takes care of them? So often we will have a will when our children are young. Then our children are growing, growing, growing. And what happens is usually a very lapse, long lapse of time where all of a sudden, 10 years goes by, 20 years goes by, and you haven't looked at that will again. So right. it's important. What do you recommend as a every so often we should be looking at our will. I recommend that about every five to eight years you look at it to see if anything has changed really significantly in your life. Mm -hmm. And and the the thing that trips up most people is when their kids get old enough to start having kids and they don't think about the fact that now grandchildren could end up with some money. And um Money can be a very wonderful thing in somebody's lives, but most 18-year-olds are ill-equipped to deal with a large sum of money entering their lives. So you're doing your children and grandchildren a favor if in your estate planning, you help spread that money out to them over time 
with someone that can give them guidance. For instance, in my will, I have three children and one grandchildren. And in my will, it says that there's money to take care of the kids if I die. And there's money for college, for sure. And then they would get a third of the money when they're 25, and a third when they're 30, and a third when they're 35. Now, I'm a financial planner, and I'm pretty sure I've given my kids some good money lessons. But it's highly likely that even with that, my kids are going to blow that first third. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, that's what kids do. You hope you taught them. And we actually did something somewhat similar, but ours was 40. And the reason why we did that was because in today's life, um, our culture, 60% of marriages end up in divorce. And so if you don't, so if you give it to your son or daughter and they're married and then all of a sudden they break, um, you know, and you're not, both your parents aren't there, then your son or daughter who own, has all your real, you know, your inheritance, yep. then it gets divided in half. So that's another advantage of giving them in, in different time frames. And also I personally, our, my husband and I felt it was important for that they learn to create their own wealth, that they didn't yes. just sit on their laurels and say, Oh, mom and dad gave us X number of dollars and we don't have to work so hard. Um, yep. Large sums of money at a young age tend to kill work ethic. Yeah. And that's not what most of us want for our children. We want them to be self-sustaining, you know, individuals that are contributing to society. So um, the, the um, provisions also in a will, especially for grandchildren, can mirror that of what we just talked about. So if your child is not alive, then their children would get their share, and then it would spread out to the grandchildren that way too. Now, so, is that through a trust as well? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. what about grandchildren that aren't born? Um, you're, you don't have to name the grandchildren in your documents as long as they're children of the children that you have named in there. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, because then all of a sudden, two years later, you have three more children, you know, or, mm -hmm. um, or one child might not be married. So this, it's, it's, it's important to revisit your will or to at least write it well enough where it covers a wide variety of scenarios, if you will. Now, here's one thing that I'll also say that a lot of people don't realize is that if you have an investment account or a financial account and you have a beneficiary listed on that, the beneficiary listed at the company level trumps your will. So your will can say whatever it wants, but it's never gonna get to your will if you have a beneficiary designation at the company level. So not only is it important to review your will, but it's also important to review your beneficiary designations, make sure that's how you want it to happen. Very important. Good. Good, good, good to hear. And then there's, of course, things like, um, and I probably won't have the right language here, that we can, we can give a certain amount each year as a gift. Correct. Without penalty. What's that called now? So that's the gifting exclusion, and that's while you're alive. That's not when you've passed away. So right. during your life right now, and these numbers change every year, but this year it's 14000 You can gift $14,000 to somebody if you want to. And it gets kind of fun to think about this. Let's say there was a large you know, sum of money or, or you, you've accumulated some wealth and you want to distribute that to your family while you're alive. You can give 14000 to someone, and your husband can give 14000 to someone. So that's $28,000 that you as a couple can give to someone. And if they're married, you can also give 28,000 to the spouse. And then if they have kids, you can give 28,000 to each, you know, collectively to each child. So you can pass a significant amount of money down to a family um, doing it within the gifting strategies, but you just can't do more than $14,000 from one person to another person in any year. And there's tax benefits both, both for both the person giving it away and the person receiving it. The receiver does not pay tax on that either. Correct. Mm -hmm. So it's really important. You know what? It's a beautiful thing to give money when you're alive to see them use it. And you can also say, I'm going to gift you 14000 and I'd like you to put whatever, a third, as Mary suggested, into your retirement fund you know like right. you can say this is part of the requirement mm -hmm. you know, instead of, so or helping them with their um down payment on a new home or first home things like that or paying off the college debt so these are a lot of things that a financial planner will help you realize that are out there if you don't know about or mary's book to help you get informed <laughs> um 
to benefit. Do you know anything about um, skip a generation type uh, trusts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the skip a generation trust means that you've decided that you don't want the money to land with your children. You want it to land with your grandchildren. Oftentimes, your children will be maybe a trustee who's in charge of it for their grandchildren, but the money's designed to skip a generation of who that wealth is actually going to go to. And again, this, that would probably happen because, I mean, you still can give some to your children, not to say that, but then you can earmark another chunk of money to skip the generation to go to the grandchildren. And it might be like Mary was saying that the grandchildren could be a, an infant or a two-year-old. And so you put it in a trust that it's there for them when they're at a certain age or um, at the trustee's you know, delineation as to when that's going to be. Yeah, there's some, there's some good reasons to use the skip a generation trust, but there's also some kind of gotcha things inside there that you have to be a little bit careful of. So when you're talking about trust planning, you want to involve your financial advisor, but you also want to involve an attorney who is very well skilled with estate planning. Um, and usually the combination of those two and maybe even your CPA would be the, the triad of people you want on your team to put your estate plan into place. Great. Great. Well, I think we've covered so much. We've covered people who are at the low end, the high end, and uh, people that aren't in the beginning stages at all, trying to get into this um, very important, life-changing um, vehicle about saving, creating a saving and retirement savings that's going to provide you, hopefully, comfort and happiness and um, this ease as you transition um, into retirement. And so um, I thank you so much, Mary, for sharing everything that you've explained and, and did such a wonderful job. I thank you so much. Thank for you. Well, thanks for having me. And I encourage everybody to check out the book, Ready to Pull the Retirement Trigger. I hope that you find it adds some value in your own planning. And Cynthia, thanks so much for having me on the show. You're welcome. And again, say your, your website. And she talked to you about that little budget free tool that you can download and opt in to um, get this document to, to go through it. And then, of course, I'm sure there's a contact link on her website that you, if you need to reach out to Mary, she can yes. get back to you. It's at sterkfinancialservices.com. That's S is in Sam, T is in Tom, E R K. So thank you so much. Have a great night. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us. I hope you found this very valuable. And I, I'm once again, I actually love interviewing our fabulous guests. And Mary, all the best to your new book. I uh, wish you much success. So thanks for coming. Thank you. Take care.